Okay, again, welcome. My name is Annie Lindekugel. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Executive Director for the Community Services Network. Super excited to have you all here today. Thanks so much. Um, we'll go ahead and kick it off with Maddie from the Inside Out Network. Thanks so much for being here. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for having me. And as she said, my name is Maddie. I'm the Director of Operations with the Inside Out Network. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that works to try and help connect those who are uh, releasing from incarceration with different service providers in the community that can help in that transition process. So um, we are in Illinois, Arizona, and then over about the past like year and a half or so, we have been expanding to Oregon as well. Uh, so we have been really actively trying to build a provider network in Oregon of different community partners who want to be, um, you know, on our platform as a resource to individuals who have been justice involved. Uh, we have a partnership with the Oregon Department of Corrections, so they are registering people as early as six months prior to their release. We just started that phase of things in May, uh, so it's still pretty new, about a month and a half ago. It was like the beginning of May. Um, and then uh, they can connect with service providers in the community via messaging and different things, um, like I said, starting at that six months prior to release. And then also continuing for any length of time post-release. So um, even, in, even if an individual is already released and is needing support, they can also register with us. Um, so, so yeah, so we will kind of go over all of that today, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a background. Um, and so, like I said, we have the partnership with Oregon Department of Corrections, and then we have really just been actively building a network. Something that makes our network a little bit unique is all the providers are self-enrolled. So they have all had to create their own profile, um, and their own account in order to be registered with us. Um, and so that takes a little bit of time, right, to connect with different community partners, um, so that they register on our network. Um, so I am going to share my screen here in a minute and kind of walk you guys through like, what does the platform look like? Uh, how do individuals register? It's also optional for returning citizens. So uh, they can choose to register or not, but it is um, an option given to them. And then I'll walk you through their user experience and then also what it looks like for a provider so that you guys can see like what goes into provider registration and also the different things they can do. Because it's a multi-sided platform, meaning that returning citizens can search for help in the community, but providers can also um, see returning citizens, see that they're releasing and reach out to them proactively as well if they're wanting to do so. Um, so please feel free if you have any questions as I go. It's kind of hard for me usually to keep keep up with the chat, but just, um, you know, feel free to kind of chime in if you do have any questions as I'm sharing as well. I'll help you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can you guys see my screen and still hear me? Okay. Hopefully. Awesome. Okay. So this is what it looks like. So to access us, you just want to go to the insideoutnetwork.net and that's how you access our site. I'm just going to kind of quickly go through the returning citizen registration. Like I said, returning citizens, it's optional for them. If they choose to register with us, they do get to complete their own registration. And this is the piece that is offered to them as early as six months prior to release. So right now we started with registration. It's kind of like our pilot phase at one facility, oh, two facilities, Deer Ridge and Warner Creek. And then we're going to continue to roll out to the rest of the facility facilities as well. But they just fill out some basic information about themselves. They create a username and password for their ION account so that they can access things. Um, if they don't have an email, that's fine. It's not required. So I'm just going to kind of go through some of this quick. But we do have an option for friends or family if they would like to have us share this information with friends or family so that they can help them use it. We offer that as well. Uh, release address is really important because individuals, so when they're using our site to look for community partners to help, everything is anchored based off their release location. So if they don't have a street address, that's fine, but at least city and state um, or zip code is important just so we can match them with providers relative to the area in which they want to be. Uh, they can list a phone number if they would like. There's some questions regarding uh, offenses or convictions. These are optional. They do not have to answer. We actually have no restrictions as a platform. Anyone is welcome to use our site. But as you guys are probably aware, sometimes there are restrictions based on certain things. So if they want to disclose upfront, they're welcome to do so. 
there's a question regarding education. And then here are our nine categories. So when I'm saying service provider, right, like what exactly does that mean? Basically, if any organization provides services in any of these categories to those who have been justice involved, they're considered a provider or they can be considered a provider on our platform. So when an individual is registering, they want to make sure they're selecting whatever it is they want help with upon their release from incarceration. So um, yeah, like they can choose one category, they can choose all nine, whatever's applicable to them and their needs. And then there's a box where they can share some additional information about themselves. So anything else they want to share with providers, uh, like I said, providers can see their profiles, they can see who's coming home, they can even reach out. So if they're wanting to share something specific with providers, they can do so in this box. And then that's just, like I said, kind of quickly, but that's what goes into the returning citizen registration. Once they have an account created, um, let me see. I will kind of, I'm going to log in now and show you what that looks like as well. So you're able to see like, how can they actually use this, right? To search for help in the community. Let's see, my computer is loading a bit slow right now. But I'll go ahead and sign in. So um, I'm going to sign in just as a demo returning citizen for today, right? So um, it's just a demo profile. Let me give it a second to kind of catch up here. But Lola, she's our, like I said, demo returning citizen for the day. If an individual wants to edit any of their information, they can just go to my profile and edit it. Uh, the biggest things they typically do, though, are search for providers, right? So I'm going to click search by category. And here are our nine categories. So like I said, an individual is able to use this pre-release, post-release, but they can search by the different nine categories. Um, so say like Lola is wanting to connect with, um, you know, let's see, like shelters and housing, right? Post-release. If I go ahead and click on this, then any provider that helps with shelters and housing within a certain mile radius, in this case, it will always default to 15 miles of Lola's release location will come up for her. So as I mentioned, everything is anchored based on that release address. So up at the top, that's what this location is. It's that re release address she put on her profile when she registered. Like I said, it will default to 15 miles, but she can change this anywhere from five, you know, up to 100 miles. On the right-hand side, you see where the providers are located. And on the left-hand side, you see a list of the different providers. Again, all of these providers, right, have been self-enrolled. They've created their own profiles and registered with us as well. So if I wanted to check out, an, you know, an organization to learn more, I can click on like Organ Change Clinic, and then you can see um, that there's some additional information about them. So where are they located, right? The services they provide. Um, Pre-release, usually their website link is, you know, not accessible. Post-release, they can go to the organization's website. They can call. They can message both pre and post release. So that's kind of exciting because they're able to actually just click on message, type in the message, uh, hit send, and it will go directly to that provider. They can read some additional information that has been shared by the provider. They can favorite the organization if they think it's interesting. They can just click on favorite and then all of their favorites populate to a separate tab as well. So that is um, what they can do. They can search all nine categories that exact same way. So they just click on search by category, select the category they want to search, and then go through and they can check out different organizations. They can also search directly by name. So if they've heard of an organization specifically, they can just type them in by name and find them that way. The saved service provider list, I'm going to go ahead and click on this. This is a list of favorites I was mentioning. So any organization that Lola has favorited, you can see we just favorited Organ Change Clinic, right? She can just click on them from this page and it will take her right back to that individual provider page as well. So uh, it just kind of helps because Lola, like a lot of times in Organ Department of Corrections right now, they're able to use like the WorkSource computer lab rooms to access this prior to release. And um you know, they come back for different sessions, but anytime they come back, as long as they use the same login information, any favorites they have, all of that is saved in their account. Also, what is saved are all of their messages. So on the right-hand side here, any organization that Lola messages or any organization that messages her, all the messages will be saved in her account. So in this place, if I click on like organ demo provider, right, all the content of our conversation is saved in one place. So she's able to refer back to her messages as well as favorites. Um, and like I said, as long as that same login information is being used. And so um, that's that's a lot of what Lola, like I said, can do. She can also reach out to the Inside Out Network if she's needing help. You can just click on provide feedback and there's multiple ways for them to get a hold of us as well. 
I am going to log out quickly and then show you what it looks like for a provider. So you guys can kind of see that as well. Like I said, providers can see returning citizens. They can see that they're coming home. Uh, but do you have any questions for me at this stage? No? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and log out then, and I'll show you what it looks like for a um, provider. So on the provider end of things, so this is what it will look like kind of similar to the returning citizen, but obviously they use it for different things. So one, a provider, they can, I'm going to kind of like skip the provider registration for now, just for sake of time, but um, it's about the same length as it is on the returning citizen. And basically all the information you saw when we were looking at like the organ change clinic, the website, the phone number, descriptions, that's what goes into the provider registration. Um, but they can connect with individuals, like I said, um, they get notified of those who are releasing. So this new and upcoming releases tab, this 24, this means that there are 24 individuals within a certain mile radius of the provider and who are also looking for the types of services they provide. So in order for individuals to come up on this list, there has to be the relevant category matching. So from that nine list, right, providers choose from the same thing. So for example, um, in order, if a an organization only provides housing, then these individuals would need would have needed to select housing when they were registering to come up on this list for providers. And then also be within, like I said, kind of a certain mile radius. So basically we're trying to have relevant matches listed here for providers. Um, and then the provider can go through and can learn more about different individuals. So like just for sake of the demo, if, if I were to click on this name right, you can see additional information about them as well. Um, and so the provider can reach out by sending them a message directly. They can um, reach out by phone or email if they would like. They can make some different distinctions by making people green or red, et cetera. So there's just different things they can do to connect with uh, returning citizens uh, pre-release and also post-release. Yeah. Quick question on that, Maddie. So if you have an agency with multiple individuals, um, under that agency, can they all see each other's notes to make sure that folks are getting reached out to, or how does that work? Yes. So as long as you're using the same login, uh, like the same provider login, which typically is the case, right? Um, especially if you're all at one location or something that then it will all be saved in your account as well. So if you're making notes or match relevant distinctions or anything like that, like you will all get to see these notes. Um, so it's just basically up to the organization and if they're comfortable sharing that information. So but like I said, yeah, they can, if they were to message Ralph, then they can write a note here, um, but they can also on the dashboard, they would see the messages that have been sent and they would see that like, oh, that individual has a message sent as well. So yeah, any notes sent or notes made, distinctions made, messages sent, anybody who uses the provider login will be able to see that. And then as a provider, they can also group message. They can sort the list. So say I want to sort by release date. I can click on release date. And then everyone who's being released in the current month will move to the top of the list. So you can see in this case now, everyone who's being released in the month of June has moved to the top. On the left-hand side, you can see I can click on these bubbles. I can group message individuals by going up to the top and clicking group message, right? Um, and then it will send that th those messages to all the individuals who have a filled in bubble. I can also export the information. So maybe you guys have your own ways of reaching out or you have your own data collection methods or something like that. You can just export all the returning citizen data into an Excel spreadsheet and use that information as you would like as well. So that is like a lot of what um, providers can do. Like I said, they can do everything the same as a returning citizen as far as searching providers, connecting with providers as well. But they also have this piece to proactively reach out to returning citizens if they'd like. Um, you can see on the right-hand side too, they have messages saved. Lola, right? That's kind of our demo, another demo returning citizen. Um, all the content is saved for providers as well. Yes, it looks like someone has a question. Yeah, this is Layla. So very cool tool um, question, you know, with your clients, I show you show a release date. I mean, a, uh, a date of when they came in and when they were released. Right. But yeah. do you show a state of the re of, of the client? So in, it could be that they were denied, rejected for some reason or that they did complete whatever, you know, uh, provisions was made. Do you have any way to identify the state of that client? Um, I don't know if I understand your question correctly. So do you mean like the, um, 
like if they're being applying for like parole or something or they're being denied or right so you want to know whether or not you have satisfied that client's need it could be that the client doesn't qualify for your services and you had to deny it and there would be a notation of why this client was denied yeah so we yes yeah, so I, okay so if i understand your um question a little bit so we don't have it's kind of like so maybe you're thinking a little bit too of like kind of closed loop referral systems where you put like, yes, we met this client's needs or no, we didn't meet this client's needs. Right. Or something like that. Right. Right. Yeah. So we don't have, our platform was designed a little bit differently than that. Um, so you don't have to make any distinction on our end. And even these new and upcoming releases, although, like I said, we try to make them like somewhat relevant matches, right? Not everybody that comes on this list is going to be a match for you. Um, so that's kind of why like there's some of the distinctions you guys can make on your end, like making individuals red or green for yes, a match, you know, no, not a match. Uh, but that's really just for your own in-house purposes. We don't actually check any like, because it's not really referral based. So we don't really check on our end, right? Um, like if you're able to help a client or not, or that kind of thing, that's kind of just like up to you as an organization. Um, it's really just a tool for the returning citizen to directly to connect with you. So like if they were to message you, right? Um, you know, I'm looking for help with this. And if you guys can or can't help and you get back to them, that's pretty much all you need to do. You don't have to make any separate distinction or anything like that. Um, yeah, it's a little oh. bit different than like a closed loop, traditional closed loop referral system kind of thing. Okay, great. I appreciate that. Yeah. Hopefully that was helpful. Sorry. Yes. Uh, any other questions? There's a couple in the chat too. Wow. Okay. Um, From Bruce. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Um, let me see. The chat is coming. And then um, and I see yours after. Okay. Let me see. Oh, thank you, Oxford House. We love having you guys. I saw that. Um. Okay. What is the relationship with county probation? So yes, we have um tried to work a bit with um with county probation. So like last May, I believe our executive director went out and met with all the probation directors, and that was actually the resource list that we started with were from the um county probation directors and things. So we worked with community corrections to try and get like the resource list that they currently use. And that was kind of our starting point. So we have worked with them and we have met with a lot of their staff. Now that we are into the returning citizens, because for a while, right, um, we're just building our network of providers. And we had to get like 70 providers in Oregon before we even begin registering returning citizens. So now that we just started registering returning citizens, as of like I said, the beginning of May, we're planning to circle back with community corrections and with probation to kind of just reiterate, like, please remind people that they have this when they get out, or if they didn't register prior to release, they can register now. Uh, so we do kind of plan on circling back with them now that we're in the second phase, but we have worked with them kind of since the beginning in order to get resource lists and different things like that. So, um, yeah, that's kind of our relationship with community corrections so far, but it was helpful because we are trying to be statewide in Oregon. So we do want to try to have uh, resources, you know, across the state. Um, I think that was the only question so far I've seen in the chat, but it looks like Fern, I think you have one as well. I do a quick question. Quick question. Did you design this program or is this a program that somebody else designed for you? The, so the yeah, the what we just saw. Yeah. So Fred Nelson, our executive director, he created this. Um, he was he's actually a pastor by trade and got involved in prison ministry work back in Illinois. But during that time, he really discovered like a need for reentry um, and just a connection tool that didn't really exist yet in this space in this way. So uh, Fred, actually, yeah, our executive director, Fred Nelson, he created it. Um, there's lots of multi-sided platforms. Like we think about like dating sites or um, like Ubers and Lyft for riders and drivers or um, eBay for buyers and sellers or things like that. So he kind of took that same platform idea that connects somebody providing a serv service and somebody seeking a service um, and put that in reentry. So nice. Thank you very much. That's very well laid out. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. I We, we really appreciate that. Um, let's see. I think I have another question. Okay. If an individual is no longer on parole. Uh, yes. So this is for, um, 
yeah, anybody who's ever been justice involved at any point in time in their life. So even if they were never incarcerated, but maybe just on probation and still might experience some barriers or some challenges, um, even if they were incarcerated, but have been out a decade and completely off community supervision, they can register at that point. So we have no restriction. Technically, individuals can register with us as early as 11 months prior to release. Like I said, in Oregon Department of Correction facilities, they're doing it about six months, but then for any length of time post-release. So yeah, if someone's ever been justice involved, literally at any point in time, like I was working with an individual in Arizona who he does like a lot of peer support stuff and he registered himself um, and he's been out since 05. But he's like, I just want to know what it's like. And I want to be helping people use this. And he was incarcerated at one point. So um, yeah, we have for any length of time, they're able to register with us. Of course, there are some providers that are very like, you know, we help 90 days, um, right, you know, immediately post release or something like that. But we definitely have providers who will help at any point in time as well. Any other questions? I think too, I can put my, um, oh, yes. It looks like Peg, you might have one. I think you're muted. Hi, uh, yeah, good morning. I was wondering if you had any um, like flyers or any other types of advertisement that we could put out for people already living in the community who may have previously been justice involved. Is that some kind of marketing you guys already have? Yeah, absolutely. We have flyers that we share with both returning citizens and providers both. So yes, I would be happy to send some, I, I don't know if it'd be helpful if I put my email in the chat maybe, but I would be happy to send you um, like some PDF version of the flyers or whatever is helpful. And um, yes, we do have ones that like we share with people who are already in the community. So Yes, if you guys know anybody, like I said, on the provider end, on the returning citizen end, or whichever who could benefit from this platform, you know, we would love to help help get them registered in, in whatever way. So um, you guys are always welcome to share our information. I can send some flyers and uh, share my information as well. And, and yeah. So. Perfect. And Maddie, I can post that to the, sorry, the website afterwards. Okay. Um, if you send those to me. And then if you just wouldn't mind putting your email in the chat so folks could connect with you directly, if they have any questions, that would be amazing. Absolutely. Yes. I'll add my email to the chat now and I'll make sure to send you those flyers. And thank you guys so much for your time this morning. I know I'm about my stop point, so I just really appreciate it. Um, you know, you guys having me here and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. I'd love to connect with you further. So thank you. Thank you so much, Maddie. Appreciate it. Such a great platform. And, uh, collaboration of resources. So thank you again. All right. Next up, we have um, Bren Peterson with Easter Seals, Oregon, their Homeless Veterans Reintegration Program. Bren, are you going to hide? There you are. Hi, here Welcome. I am. Sorry. Welcome. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, of course. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Ah, there we go. Okay. No. How do I go back? One sec, sorry. This is my first time sharing a screen. Um, okay. So my name is Bryn Peterson. I work for the Easter Seals um, Homeless Veteran Reintegration Program. We more casually call it the Homeless Veteran Employment Program. Um, HVRP is just the name of our grant. Um, so what we do is we assist veterans that are homeless or at risk of homelessness, work through any barriers that they have to employment, and then we provide assistance in becoming job ready. Um, so we have a few different eligibility requirements. One is a homelessness requirement. So there's a few different ways that we classify homelessness. Um, if a veteran is living in veteran-specific supportive housing, such as VASH, SSVF, um, something along those lines, they would qualify for our program, as well as living in a traditional shelter or living in a situation such as being like living in a car, in a tent, on the street, being um, physically unhoused. Um, also, we would consider people living with family or any other situations that they're living in it that are um, proof of economic struggle or proof of um, if they didn't have the supportive housing, then they likely would be on these streets is kind of how our grant classifies homelessness. Um, in order to enroll in our program, they must also be a veteran. So how our grant classifies veterans is that they must have completed at least one day of active duty if somebody's wanting to enroll in our program and they were in the National Guard or the reserves, then they must have been activated for duty for at least one day that's not training. 
Um, and then they must have a discharge status that is other than dishonorable. Finally, they must just be looking for work. That's our final requirement. So we provide job readiness assistance. Um, these are just some examples of things that we do. Um, any barriers that they have to employment, we identify and then help them work through, such as housing referrals, resume assistance, career coaching, interview practice. We have tons of employer connections in the community. We also have tons of community resources that we connect people with. Um, so it's a case-by-case -case basis, whatever they feel like is preventing them from finding work. We help identify with them and then through our own resources and through the community, we help them work through those barriers. Once they feel like they are adequately prepared for finding work, then we can help with financial assistance for things like interview clothing. We can help pay for trainings. We also partner with a lot of organizations in the community to pay for trainings that are a little bit more extensive. We can also pay for work tools, work clothing, um, transportation assistance, such as gas cards and bus passes. Um, again, really anything that we can justify as helping them towards employment are things that we can usually pay for. We also offer retention services for the veterans that are enrolled in our program. So once a veteran in our program finds a job, we check in on them monthly to ensure that they still have secure housing and employment for a year. And if any point in time during that year that they exit our program into employment, they're no longer working and their housing is no longer stable, they come back onto case management and we help them once again, find work, find housing, and ensure that they're gonna be very successful. We also have no referral process, which is very easy for everyone. Um, veterans can either give us a call, you're welcome to give out our numbers to anybody, um, or we are welcome to just take names and numbers and we can reach out to them. Here is the contact information for us. Um, the slides that I sent Annie, I realized this morning did not have this, um, this contact information page. So I will put in the chat when we're done here, all this contact information as well. Sorry about that. That's, you can also just resend the slide deck and I can reload. Okay. I sent it to you at like 9, 10. So sorry. Oh, great. Okay. No worries. No okay. worries. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So these are all of our contact numbers. Our program is out of Washington in Multnomah County. So again, you're welcome to call or text or email any of us with just the name of a veteran and their phone number, and we'd be happy to reach out and talk to them a little bit more about our program. Um, or they can call us directly, and then we can talk about a time to sit down and do an enrollment. Um, I know that was pretty short and sweet. Um, I see some questions in the chat. Right now, we do currently have a wait list. It's not a formal wait list. Um, our grant ends the end of June. And then we start a new grant July 1st. So because of that, everybody who's currently in our program will exit the last day of June. So there's a wait list in the way that we will call people in the last week of June and ask if they're interested in enrolling in our new grant that starts July 1st. But it's not a formal wait list where they'll be waiting months and months. Usually if you call, you'll be enrolled pretty soon after. Does anybody else have any other questions? I love that you are wait that you don't have a wait list. Amazing. Yes, it, it's it's Not really common. <laughs> yeah, um, Fern. Fern, it looks like you have a question. I'm talking away and unmuted. Oh. How do you ver how do you verify uh, an applicant? Uh, whether they're honorably discharged, dishonorably um, discharged, um, or whatever your other screening processes are. Yeah, so um, if they're not sure what their uh, discharge status is, we can do a soft search through the VA of their veteran status. We can also, for people who um, have maybe not access to their DD-214, which is just the formal form that they get when they get out of the military, we can help them order those papers as well. <laughs> Okay, if somebody was um, dishonorably discharged due to potentially um, some sort of an injury that isn't necessarily notable, noted, do mm -hmm. would they be able to come to you and get assistance on getting it from honorably discharged to, I mean, dishonorable to honorable? So we would be able to assist them in referring them over to a VSO, which is a veteran service officer. And those are people that help people navigate the VA and things like discharge status changes. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm.
Are there any other questions? Awesome. All right, Bren, thank you yeah. so much. And if you wouldn't mind putting your email um, yeah. in the chat, that would be great. And then you don't have to put everyone else's. Um, I can mm -hmm. reload that. And then folks, when um, we're done, I'll reload that slide deck and then you'll have- Thank to you. Else. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate you sharing today. All right, so next up we have, and I'm not sure if all three are here, but I did see um, Brandon. So we have Brandon, Shaylee, and Steven from Restorative Roots Project. I see you, Brandon. How are you? Welcome and thanks Hello, for- Hello, everybody. Here. Thank you for having me this morning. Can you guys hear me? Yes, perfect. Thank okay. you. Okay. Sorry, my other two coworkers will not be joining me this morning. We got looped in on a whole bunch of other meetings, so we are dividing and conquering this morning. Um, pull my screen up, and I will share this with you guys. All right, can you guys see that? All right. Okay, so I'm going to start out and introduce myself to everybody. My name is Brandon Brown. I am the Director of Community Outreach, Client Relations, and I'm also a Restorative Justice Facilitator with Restorative Roots Project. Um, we are a, a holistic restorative justice program aimed at the restoration and transformation of individuals and the community. I will do quick intros of the folks that have not joined us, but this is our executive director, Stephen Fowler. And this is Shaley Pickrell. She is director of operations. And these are some contract folks that are, they work with us behind the scene doing all kinds of extra stuff. But this individual, Kay Enyart, is now a full-time employee with us on our team now. She is our office manager. So something special about everybody inside our organization is we all have lived experience. So that is something very crucial to us having here in our organization. It makes us feel more connected with uh, our clients. And so what I mean by the lived experience is most of us have either been in the incarcerated in our system or have worked within the system. Uh, some of the folks that work with us are uh, harm parties of crimes that have occurred. Uh, down this way. And I will give you guys a little bit of background of who we are. So our organization was founded in 2021. We were originally housed under another organization, uh, the Inside Alliance. Um, uh, so, yeah, we were funded by Housing Bill 2204, which funded eight different organizations across Oregon. These organizations have already had existing uh, restorative justice programs or were getting ready to start restorative justice programs. Uh, the Inside Alliance got awarded one of those grants, and so... I was already working with the Inside Alliance and Shaylee was a contractor with the Inside Alliance. She was working in uh, McLaren at the time. And at the time I was uh, working with uh, the Inside Alliance, I was going inside McLaren teaching a 10 week class on mindfulness. So that's how me and Shaylee got connected. And then Stefan was also a contractor with OYA. He was coming in teaching restorative justice classes. So we all knew each other prior to this organization that we had started. Um, like I said, we were 
part of another organization in 2021. Uh, we all were hired on board by the Inside Alliance to start this program. So it has been created by the three of us from the ground up. This is our baby. This is our little child right here that we are birthed into the rest of the world. And uh, 2023, we separated from the Inside Alliance and became our, our own 501c3 nonprofit. So currently right now, services that we provide are community circles, organizational circles, conflict resolution circles, equity informed mediation, program evaluations, community referrals, educational speaking, restorative justice training. And then we also have our SAP program, which is one of our main programs, which I will speak about here in a second. And then our art reinvestment in the BIPOC community program. Our SAP program, which is our Survivor Centered Alternative to Prosecution program. This program is the the backbone of our organization. It's how we originally started work with. Uh, we do we do work. Our our partners are with Multnomah County uh, Public Defender's Office and Metropolitan uh, District Attorney's Office. So we get those referrals for this program from those two folks. We focus on taking measure ballot measure eleven. Uh, violent offense cases right now with this program. And so in the traditional way of how this system would work is folks would get charged with a crime, then they would go and get go to the grand jury, get indicted, do some jail time, and so on and so forth. But with our program, we are a pre-indictment program. So before folks would get in an indictment, the DA's office and the public defender's office would go through their criteria of a case and then they would send it over to us. We work with both the responsible party and the harm party in these cases. Um, with the responsible side, we do accountability and responsibility work with them. And on the harm party side, we do trauma-informed work with that person. Um, before we get into any of our work with any of these individuals, we go through a needs assessment uh, to get everybody back to baseline into all their basic needs. Because here we know that you can't focus on doing any kind of work with an individual if you're worried about paying bills, you got rent, you might need some counseling, you know, there's there's needs with addiction and so on and so forth. So we might work with individuals for months just getting them to baseline. After that, then we break down into the work with both individuals separately. Our ultimate goal is to get everybody into what we call a restorative community conference. Where both sides will come together with uh individuals that they feel are part of their support circle. It'll be me and another facilitator. And we will have several different community members come together and we will sit in a circle. Each side will be able to tell their stories, ask questions. And eventually we like to have everybody come together and think of a plan that the responsible party can do to rectify the damages and harm that they have caused in the harm party's eyes and in the community's eyes as well. That individual will then complete that plan that they have. And then at the end of that plan, we send our cases back to the DA's office and they expunge the crime from their record. So that is our SAP program and our main program that we do. We have now taken that SAP program and we have now implemented it into doing community referrals right now. So right now our community referrals come from just uh, partners that we have. So we are now in the process 
I don't even want to say some names because we haven't even signed the finalized contracts with these guys yet. <laughs> but there are two other big organizations that we are going to be taking referrals from. And we are also in the talks of negotiating and starting within the hopefully the next five to six months doing this program with the youth. So that is all of what we have. Oh, also there was our art reinvestment, but I do not have a slide up here for that because it is not started yet. But we have an art reinvestment program, which is also going to be tied to our youth programming. Uh, where we used art-based therapy to help the individuals express themselves in our work. And we also invest in buying and supporting art from the BIPOC community. Any questions? Uh, yeah, Layla. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you for doing this. So are you restricted to just Multnomah County or what's your territory? Uh, right now, yes, we are strictly in Multnomah County, but one of those contracts that I said aren't finally inked will be in Washington County. Great, thank you which that one will, will be uh, basically a bias hotline that you will be calling and doing these kind of calls. And then we will be doing the work with the individuals through that. Do you, I mean, sorry, can I ask another question? Go for it. Do you co work closely with the police department? No, we do not. Okay. Uh, we are in talks with doing some work with the police department out here. Um, Washington County has a hotline that they can use, and we want to start a hotline out here in Multnomah County. So that is something that we've been in talks with. Uh, there is another organization that does do similar restorative justice work, and they work very closely with the police department right now. But you said you do work with the DA's office. Yes, we do work with the DA's office and the public defender's office. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yes. And Brandon, it looks like there's another question in the chat from Gina. Um, I thought I heard Mind Solutions was closing. Will there be a replacement for them with your org? So yes, Mind Solutions is closing very sadly. Um, so the director of Mind Solutions is actually going to stay on board with us, and she is going to be our full-time therapist. Um, also, where she is going to, we are in talks with negotiating with that organization that she is now going to be a part of. Awesome. And Bruce has a question, it looks like. Hi, good, good morning. Uh, with the advent of uh, uh, Measure 110 being uh, modified so that small quantities of drugs will can get you arrested, do you have a relationship with the, uh, uh, the treatment uh, services that back up uh, addiction? I, I'm struggling with this question. What's the relationship between the Evolving 110 and your organization? Um, right now, currently, we, we do have services that we provide for folks that have addiction. There are several organizations that we are tied with. Um, we're trying to figure out where we fit in in the 110 thing besides providing the services for our clientele, but we know that like clients that come into our program that may be facing drug addiction pro problems, like that's a big thing for us is getting them the service that they need before we even break into doing the work. So yeah. we do have several inpatient places that we work with and two outpatient places that we work with. And I would hope that you're plugged in with the Washington County uh, CAT program the center for triage and treatment um not right now because like i said most of our our 
uh, all our clientele that we get through these cases are from Multnomah County. And we are just now like branching into Washington County with stuff. So I will put them down as somebody to contact and uh, try to get involved with since we are branching out into Washington County. The, the cat is Washington County's uh, uh, so uh, detox and uh, uh, initial treatment program. Okay. Good luck to you. Yes, thank you very much. All right, any other questions for Brandon? Awesome, thank you so much, Brandon. This is such a powerful program and just super appreciate you being here today to share it. And if you wouldn't mind also adding your email to the chat so folks could follow up with you um, just in case they have additional questions that pop up. And Absolutely. You know, I'll be reaching out for a follow-up. I have some ideas that popped in my head as we, as you were talking. So <laughs> um, just such an important awesome. program, definitely. Um, and uh, just thank you so much for being here. So Very welcome. Thank you for having me. You bet. You bet. Awesome. And then if it's okay, if you, did you send over your slide deck? Um, I was going to ask if you did get it. I sent it over last night. Okay. I'm not sure okay. if you received it or not. I will. So. This morning I got, I was one of the lucky folks who got stuck on the highway for like almost two hours <laughs> trying to get to work. So I kind of came in at the ninth hour. So I'll check and let you know. All right. Thank you so much. Okay, next up, we have Sarah Lopez with the Belong PDX. Sarah, are you on? Yes, hello. Awesome, welcome. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Can I share my screen? Do I have access to do that? Yes, you do. I think, Brandon, you might have to unshare yours. Okay. Perfect, awesome, thank you. And let me know, Sarah, if you have any challenges. Oh, um, I have to do the right thing here. I swear they move the buttons around all the time. <laughs> okay. Do we, let's see, do we see my screen? Yes. Is it present mode? Okay. Awesome. Yep. Perfect. All right, my name is Sarah Lopez. I am founder, executive director of We Belong PDX. And um, we, our vision is to give kids a strong sense of belonging and value. We run year round out of school programs um, with the uh, approach of taking a preventative approach to mental health. Let me go over, there we go. I'm just gonna briefly share a founding story. So my background is education. I was a classroom teacher for seven years, um, mostly elementary. And I um, then uh, during fast forward to COVID, I had already left the classroom and uh, wanted to support in the neighborhood that I grew up in. And so I went and knocked on doors and offered one-on-one -on -one academic support in the parking lot. Uh, within a matter of weeks, realized that um, rather than prioritizing academics, that um, it was essential to prioritize these children's mental health. I saw um, severe social anxiety, depression, um, cutting, suicidal ideation. It's really tragic to see that in such young kids. And so I essentially switched routes and began to just bring what I called my Mary Poppins bag full of arts and crafts and um, discovered their interests and brought activities that aligned with those. And we began um, to do those activities in the parking lot. And the goal was to reduce stress levels through COVID. I had some friends that joined in, wanted to um, help out. Um, when the rains came, a church offered us their space for free because they were not using it at that time. And so it began um, to turn into a program that began to fill the need um, there was for the families in that neighborhood. We now have three different sites um, at three different churches, and we are running year-round programs for over 50 kids. We um, take the approach where we first get to know the school counselor of a school nearby the church and uh, ask for recommendations from the local school counselor. 
to begin our program. And then we have um, some elements of wellness. I'm actually going to skip this. These are some stats on the situation. I think a lot of us are aware how tragic the situation is right now in mental health for kids. Um, and this is just some different um, quotes taken from the U.S. Surgeon General's advisory on um, the epidemic of loneliness and isolation. Dr. Perry is a leading neuroscientist and um, child psychiatrist. And in a book that he wrote, What Happened to, that we recommend this quote has really helped us um, design those four elements of wellness and what to surround our programming around. It says, our major finding is that your history of relational health, your connectedness to family, community, and culture is more predictive of your mental health than your history of adversity. Similar to other researchers looking at the power of positive relationships on health, connectedness has the power to counterbalance adversity. So at the focal point of our programming is trusted relationships and wellness, whole healthy foods, adventure and creativity. So I'm gonna just touch on each of those and what they look like in our programs. Trusted relationships. So we have a staff member, the program coordinator, who runs all of um, activities, plans, prepares activities, um, runs the programming, and then also invests not just in the child regularly, but also the family. So we'll do like family check-ins, phone calls, um, maybe stop by the house, drop something off. And so really forming um, a strong connection uh, within the neighborhood. And then the group mentors. So these are volunteers um, from the community. We're always looking for more volunteers who want to um, just become, a, who want to onboard as a group mentor. So we take them through an onboarding process and a training process, and they um, invest in a group setting. They show up for program um, during program hours and connect with the kids relationally. Um, our staff and our volunteers are all trained in a neurosequential approach to, they call it a biologically respectful approach to treating children. So how do we support children in a situation of stress um, in a way that's helpful and actually helps heal uh, from a prior trauma rather than do more harm? And so we take them through um, this training that teaches this process, and then we have actually this poster up. And our goal is to teach the kids this process so that they can actually self-regulate and um, be able to then actually support other children in this process as well. Nutrition, our other element of wellness that I mentioned, so we are always providing whole healthy foods um, for the children, but we also, something that's really important is that we eat together. I found early on that many of the kids had never ate at a table before. They had never eaten together um, in, a, in a family setting. And so we prioritize eating together and making sure those um, have access, the kids have access to whole healthy foods. They also are part of that snack preparation process at times so that they can take those um, ideas is home with them, those recipes home and, um, and replicate them in that space. And there's always a question that's asked, um, conversation question that is asked during that time where we're eating together. Um, and so we're getting to know each other better as well. Creativity. So everything during our program is um, hands-on screen-free. So we do not allow phones um, to be used during our program. And we do not allow screens to be used. And we have conversations with the kids about why is it important to take a break from our screens. Uh, I was really alarmed when I saw the amount of hours that were being spent um, by our youth on social media. And um, I mean, we're talking eight hours a day. That's a full-time job. And so really intervening there and um, helping them develop interests, new hobbies, new interests um, that are hands-on, and then having that conversation of why it's important we take that break from screens. Adventure, uh, our last element here. So we um, know the importance of giving children new experiences and new challenges, right? Encouraging them to try new things, take risks, but also getting that outdoor time. Um, we are limited in the Pacific Northwest in our vitamin D exposure. And there, um, there was a study that was done just a couple of years ago. It came out that 70% of children in the United States are deficient in vitamin D, low, low or deficient in vitamin D. That is an enormous number. And so we um, have conversations with the kids about that. And our goal is that these kids are going to opt for outdoor option activities rather than indoor 
um, and that they'll know that that outdoor time is essential for their health and well being. So the youth can be engaged um, ages five, so as young as five up through 14. Um, we really see the value of going through those middle school years that are really challenging time for kids. We have found um, such incredible benefits to having uh, such a diverse age group. The older ones often take on that leadership and um, want to support the younger ones. And those younger ones, you know, are really wanting to step it up and um, having those older ones as role models really step up to their level. So it's been a great opportunity to build more of like a family-like atmosphere. 99% categorized at risk, um, free or reduced lunch, 30% in single caretaker households. And um, the youth qualify for our programming in one of two ways. So they either need to live in the neighborhood that we serve, um, so half mile radius, not um, that radius, and then they recommended by the local school counselor. So we first prioritize recommendations from the local school counselor. And then if we've, you know, gone through all those recommendations, then we will, um, we'll go ahead and, you know, just go knock on doors and offer to those in the local neighborhood. So currently our three sites are over in Centennial and Rockwood neighborhoods. Um, so right there in the board of Gresham, the one in Rockwood is technically Gresham, um, address. And then we are looking to open uh, in the new year, in the beginning of 2025, another location that actually is going to be right next to Vestal Elementary School on 82nd. So that's our next one that we are looking at. Um, we are at capacity right now, and we do have a waiting list um, for kids. We are limiting the number of kids that we accept so that we can keep a ratio of um, no more than four kids to one adult. Giving kids that attuned attention is really important, and it needs to be a space where the kids uh, can reduce their stress levels. And, you know, when there's a lot more kids at it, it can become a stressful environment, and that defeats the purpose of really what we're trying to do. So we do keep numbers limited and um, we have 12 to 15 kids at each site and um, the same will go for the next location we're going to open we have um, opposite days though so we're going to serve Monday Wednesday 12 to 15 kids Tuesday Thursday 12 to 15 kids so you know if you're in that area if you know families near um, whose kids attend Bessel Elementary that will be our next next location um, so this just goes through some stats of kind of where we are so far. And then these are recommended recommended reads. So we always um, actually on our website, we have a resources page. And that resources page has um, different packets. Like um, it has a social socials pack. It has, it's like called get social. Um, it's got like an eating well pack. So it's got these different, um, they're like intended for families, kid friendly. And then we actually do have some that are more um, adult oriented as well. So we've got two sets. And then these are recommendations that we make. What happened to you? This is um, the author is the, who we, um, he started Neuroschedule Network, which is the training that we use. The Anxious Generation is a book that just came out and it has been on the New York Times bestseller list for several weeks now. It is a phenomenal book um, that highlights social media and um, being a huge contributor to the mental health crisis for our youth and talks about how we have overprotected our kids in the real world. We've not let them take enough risks, given them enough responsibility, um, and we've underprotected them online. So it's really helpful to read. The Better Brain, talking about nutrition's impact on our mental health, and then our lack of movement and what's happening there um, and how we can move more to really help heal that mind. So all of these are excellent, excellent reads. And our website there, weblongpdx.org. Again, on there, there are resources. Um, also, I'm happy to give my contact information um, in the in the chat as well. But any questions? This is awesome, Sarah. I just super appreciate um, even the packs that you are adding to your website. While you might not be able to serve a ton of kiddos keeping the ratio down, which is definitely hugely important, just giving folks the tools to work with their own communities is huge. Yeah, and we're hoping to grow those, those resources that we have on there too. Right now it's pretty minimal, but we definitely wanna grow those that we offer. Wow, this is such an important program and I love how you started as well. Um, so thank you so much for all you do 
And it looks like Bruce has a question. Go ahead, Bruce. Yes. Hi. I'm wondering if you have any relationship with any of the OSU extension programs, such as 4-H. And there's also the Juntos program, which uh, focuses on getting uh, Latino kids to uh, graduate high school. I don't. Um, no, we don't have any connection to them, but I would love to get more connected to them. We actually, we just did a big family event last weekend and we had um, four nonprofits come out and share their resources. So we are always looking for other nonprofits to, to, to connect with, partner with, not just for, you know, sharing resources together, but also to invite them to family events that we have. Wonderful. Would you like a connection to the uh, uh, 4-H leader here in the county? Yes, please. Um, would it be possible to do an email introduction? I'm going to put the email in the chat right now. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks Here's your Chris. question from Elizabeth. If we know of a child and want to refer them to this, should we reach out to their counselor to be referred? Thanks. And um, so they do also need to uh, be in the vicinity in that area. Um, but if you know, you know, a child, for example, who's in the Centennial um, neighborhood attending uh, Park Lane Elementary or Harold Oliver uh, Middle School or Rockwood um, in the Rockwood neighborhood, um, that area, then yes, I, I would say um, their council is a is an option. However, even just asking um, me di directly which school they go to, because at first they would have to be going to one of the schools that we're connected to. And if they are, then yes, you can go to the counselor, but if not, then that's not really an option at this point. But we hope to grow and open more sites where that will be an option. And when did you say you're adding Vestal? In early 2025. So we're okay. aiming for um, end of January, beginning of February. Okay, perfect. So be generous. I, yeah, I might. We're hosting a fair at Vestal, so I'll. I need to connect with you on that. So fantastic. Awesome. Any other questions? Looks like one. Yes. Um, do you partner with charter schools within the district? Actually, Rockwood Preparatory Academy is one of the charter schools that we work with, um, that we have a lot of kids um, from. So we do. Yep. If they are in that area, absolutely. There is no fee. So we are um, yeah, fundraising through events and um, accessing grants and individual donors. So no fees to the families. Let's see. Bruce or uh, Elizabeth, did you get your answer, your question answered? Yes. Okay. Oh, there it is. I see it. Sorry. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Bruce. Any other questions? Perfect. All right. And this um, slide deck will also be a part of the one shared afterwards. So if you have, uh, if you want to review it or take a peek at the books or look on their website, um, you're more than welcome to. So thank you so much again, Sarah, for all that you and your team do, um, especially for all these kiddos. It's been a tough road for them and just uh, appreciate your efforts for sure. Thank you so much um, for having us. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, last but not least, we have Abigail with Home Share Oregon. Welcome, Abigail. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. Can everybody see that? Okay, awesome. So my name is Abigail Daner. I'm the area program manager for Home Share Oregon, which is a nonprofit that serves the entire state of Oregon, but I'm going to be focusing on and um, for today's presentation, because that's where I work, and I think that's where most of us are focused um, on our efforts. So the mission of HomeShare Oregon is to expand access to affordable housing through home sharing. We believe that this is a direct way to prevent housing instability, foreclosure, and homelessness. So we're really focused on the prevention side of um, the housing problem. Our goals are to shift the cultural norm in regard to home sharing, to provide direct participant support, and to engage in advocacy efforts with local and state governments to pass initiatives designed to decrease barriers to home sharing 
and to incentivize homeowners to join the home sharing movement. So nationally, the average, um, the national average for rental availability is a 95% occupancy rate. Our state is higher than that with a 96.7 rental occupancy rate. And if we zoom into Portland, it's actually 98%, which is extremely, extremely high. Um, I'm not gonna go over all the stats on this slide, um, but I just wanna focus on the fact that renters make up almost half of the Portland population, 44.5%. And there are only 2% of houses and apartments in Portland are available to rent, um, which obviously makes it extremely tough in the rental market. And on the right, you can see kind of the range of um, average monthly rents for various sizes of homes, ranging from almost 1600 for a studio apartment all the way over to 3000 for a four bedroom home or apartment. Um, I think all of us are probably aware of the fact that there's a housing crisis in Oregon. About one in three homeowners in Oregon are housing cost burdened, which means they're spending more than 30% of their income on housing. That's over half of a million Oregonians and almost a quarter of a million homeowners are severely cost burdened, which means they're spending more than half of their income on housing, um, which is just, um, you know, not untenable and unsustainable. Um, and if we zoom in a little bit, we see that in particular, our senior homeowners are really in crisis. Almost 40% of Oregonians who are over the age of 65 say that they are at risk of losing their home. Um, you can see over here, 172,000 homeowners are spending more than 30% of their income on housing, and 77,000 are spending more than half of their income on housing. So a huge percentage of the population that we serve at our organization are seniors, just because that tends to be who needs our services the most. Um, the humanitarian crisis in Oregon is really becomes apparent when you look at these statistics. We've got, at last check, at least 15,000 unhoused people living in Oregon. For every rental that becomes available, you have 14 renters competing for that single rental. And the societal cost of one person falling into homelessness is $40,000 per person um, per individual falling into homelessness to try and help them out of that situation. So again, we're really trying to focus on the prevention side and keeping people housed and keeping people in a stable um, home environment. So um, you can see here the average um, I'll take a step back and just to clarify what home sharing is, it kind of relates to the old concept of taking in a border. Um, it's the idea that you have some spare space available in your home that you want to share. Um, and so we facilitate that process by helping people rent out some extra space that they may have in their home. There's an estimated 1.5 million spare bedrooms in Oregon that are not being occupied. Um, and so we found that if we can just help some of those homeowners to find a comfortable way for them to rent out those spaces, it provides affordable housing for so many people. So the average home sharing agreement generally costs, um, ends up being about between $800 and $900 a month for the rental, which is, as you can see, less than half of what it costs to rent a one bedroom apartment. So it's really an affordable um, alternative for folks who, you know, find that finding a one bedroom apartment is just not really an option for them. And it also provides some financial resilience for the homeowner as well, because they're receiving an income every month. Um, we do feel that home sharing is a sustainable solution to the housing crisis because it is provides housing that is immediately available. Um, it's utilizing our existing resources. It doesn't require all the um, energy and materials to to, that are required to build new housing. So there's a lower carbon footprint. Um, it reduces urban sprawl. It's more energy efficient to utilize existing housing inventory than it is to build new housing. There are so many reasons I'm not gonna go into all of them here, but we feel that it, it really is an, a sustainable alternative to um, the government tends to want to uh, throw money at building more affordable housing units, which is great, but it takes a lot of time and we want to provide housing to people right now. So home sharing is a great solution because it's mutually beneficial for both the home provider and the renter, right? It, it's flexible and affordable. It can allow people more flexibility than getting locked into a lease with a rental um, 
uh, with a property management company it tends to be a little bit easier to make arrangements between an individual homeowner and the renter versus dealing with um, a lot of red tape that you might encounter with a property management company. And it's efficient and independent. So um, here, bringing back to that number of 1.5 million homes with spare bedrooms in Oregon, if we could just match 2% of those homeowners, that would provide housing for 30,000 people. And it would give 30,000 homeowners, including many who are at risk of foreclosure, um, some more financial resiliency and could possibly allow them to stay in their home. So the way that the program works is um, we are a no barrier program. Anybody who is over the age of 18 and lives in Oregon is allowed to utilize our program. There's nothing else that is required to qualify. They can just go right onto our website, which is homeshareoregon.org, and they can sign up and create a profile. We utilize an online roommate matching platform so that people can find um, a match that they feel they're really compatible with. So I'm not matching individuals up. I'm not putting anybody in anybody's homes. I'm giving them the tools to find their own best match. Um, which uses algorithms um, and questionnaires to help people find a housemate that they're really compatible with. We provide free criminal background checks, which are optional, but many people do like to utilize them. And that's available for both parties. So both the home provider and the renter can ask one another for a background check. And it's again, at no cost at all to the participants. The next step is to create a home sharing agreement, um, which acts as their lease. And we provide them with a document to help them in this process. Um, we want to make sure that people are really spending the time to talk things out in terms of their expectations um, to make sure that they're going to be satisfied with their living arrangement. We're not just trying to pair people off quickly. We want to find long-term housing solutions. So we encourage people to really take their time on this process and find somebody who's going to be a really good fit and who they really hurt from. Um, on the same page about housing expectations. After they've signed their agreement, they're ready to move in and start home sharing. Um, this is a quote here from Jan, who is one of our amazing home, uh, home providers. Um, after her son and his children ended up moving out of state for work, she found herself with a big empty house and decided to sign up as a home provider. And she ended up with this young man here who was a single father who needed a place to live. So him and his children were able to move into Jan's home and they ended up um, being a really great fit for each other. And it really helped to um, fill that gap that she was feeling from her family moving away. So it provided a really great solution for, for both parties. These are some questions that um, people might consider if they're wondering whether home sharing is right for them. Um, a lot of the folks who consider this are empty nesters, um, older adults, uh, people who might need a little bit of help around the house with some light household chores. Um, a lot of our homeowners are also older adults who are seeking companionship. They're just tired of living alone. And this provides you know, a solution for that as well. And again, mortgage burdened homeowners, people who just need a little bit of an extra income each month to make sure that they're comfortable with um, their mortgage amount. So there are a lot of different reasons somebody might um, consider home sharing and they're all totally valid and we encourage it. And for those who are on the renter side who are considering home sharing, um, some of the things that they might want to consider is if they're interested in exchanging some light household chores in exchange for lower housing costs, um, or if they're just, again, seeking companionship or experiencing a life transition and just needing an affordable place to live. There are a lot of different reasons to consider home sharing. I would say the number one reason is just people looking for affordable housing, and it's as good a reason as any other. All right, and I'm going to skip this slide because... Yeah, so that's just a little bit about us. Um, if anybody has any questions, I would love to hear them. And I'll put my email address in the chat in case anyone wants to follow up with me. That's what I want to do. Okay. Any questions for Abigail? I love this concept. It's... Um, such a great way to a lot of folks want to put in an ADU or something that is so expensive. And this is an awesome way to support the same concept, but not have that 
exceptional expense. Absolutely, yeah. I see a couple people with their hands up. Um, just, I don't know, Leanne, I think I saw you first, if you had a question. Yes, I was curious with the background checks, um, what, what would be some red flags for folks who are looking to be the renter? So, no, I'm sorry, let me let me rephrase that. Um, so what are some things that would be barriers to renting, to be the, being the renter? Yeah, absolutely. So that's a great question. Um, some barriers as a renter that you might face are um, if you are a smoker and if you have pets, it can be hard to find somebody who is um, open to living with both of those factors. They exist out there, but I have my experience found it's a little tougher for those people to find a match because okay. most homeowners are already established with their pets and a lot of them don't want a smoker in the house. Um, you know, obviously having a certain uh, criminal record can be a barrier for some folks. Um, nobody is automatically disqualified because of their background search. Um, they're, they're able to share those results and explain whatever they feel um, they need to explain when they're talking with an individual. So they do have that opportunity to, to discuss the results of the background check. That, what about children? Yeah, children? Um, yeah, people who have children have definitely found a match through our program. Um, again, it can be a little bit trickier because a lot of folks, you know, if they only have the one room in their home that they're renting mm -hmm. out, they might not be, they might only want to share their space with one person, but there are a lot of different home share setups out there. Some people are renting out in the, the entire basement of their home. Some people have multiple rooms and a bathroom that they're renting out. There are a lot of different setups. So it's certainly possible, but um, it can be a little bit trickier if you have kids uh, to find a home share. Okay. And then last question is, I'm just curious in general, um, what is the likelihood of finding a place? Uh, do you are you currently really full, for instance, like you don't have a lot of homes to share? Uh, what does your vacancy rate look like? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, what I will tell you is that we t tend to hover at around a four or five to one ratio of renters to homeowners, okay. um, which doesn't sound great. But when you compare it to the 14 people competing for every one rental market, it's actually you know quite a bit better and quite a bit less competitive than finding a rental on the open market. So, okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. That's really helpful. Those are great questions. Thank you. Bruce? Yeah, I'm wondering if you have a relationship with the Washington County Department of Aging and Veteran Services and or the uh, the, the Housing Solutions Department. Uh, the, the home share is a wonderful thing, and I do some home share myself. Um, I'm thinking of transitional housing, supporting the probation program, or mental health uh, group homes. Is, do you get into any of those kinds of uh, uh, communities to support? I haven't yet. You know, I, that's a great idea. Um, we often get approached, tend to, it's more likely that those groups tend to approach us looking for housing because we, we don't have any trouble finding renters. There's no shortage of <laughs> people yeah. looking to use our program for finding a place to live. So I do tend to focus my efforts more on finding um places that will yield more housing inventory, but I'm absolutely open to connecting with those groups. The Washington County Office of uh, Equity Office has a community connections newsletter that mm -hmm. share uh, would promotion would fit right into. So yeah. uh, the, the CSN advertisement promotes the equity offices community connection. So you can get a link there. Great. Thank you. Thank you. It looks like there's a question in the chat, Abigail, from Elizabeth. Yeah. Are there, there any cost? Oh, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, right now, there's no cost to use the program. Um, they need to sign up through the proper channel. Um, they need to go through our website um, because we operate our, our home sharing um, or roommate matching platform is actually operational nationwide and we make it free for Oregonians. So they do need to go through our website to sign up in order to get the correct link that is gives them a free account. Um, so as long as they sign up through the proper channel, there's no cost to use it. So are you saying, Abigail, that home share is in every state? Is that 
There, no, our website that our roommate matching platform um, exists in other states. Uh, so other home sharing organizations sometimes um, will partner with them in other states, but home share Oregon is just in Oregon. We only serve Oregonians. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Abigail? Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it, everyone. Thank you so much. I don't know about you all, but I feel like I learned so much today and I've already met with a lot of these presenters. So there's just so much information out there. I think that um, I find I learn each time I watch these. So thank you so, so much to all of you for uh, sharing time and expertise with us today and for the work that you do day in and day out to everyone. Um, it definitely impacts our community and um, it's just, uh, it's, it's more fun to do it alongside all of you as well. So thank you again. And um, are there any questions or does anyone want to share any upcoming events? I know we have a lot going on in Portland um, with Juneteenth tomorrow and Pride, a lot of uh, fairs coming up. So just be on the lookout. We're trying to share more and more as we can um, as we receive them through the CSN Weekly resource email. So please make sure you send your events to us so we can add those to our resource email. Uh, Fern, it looks like you have a, uh, your hand raised. Yes, is, um, I wanna make an announcement. Is now a good time? Of course, you go okay. ahead. Okay. <clears throat> I'm uh, Fern Wilgus, I'm with Brain Injury Connections Northwest and we're teaming up with PSEP. That's the Portland Community Engagement uh, Policing Program. And uh, we're going to be um, having on uh, June 26, a um, community forum, a partner forum on, um, <clears throat> excuse me, brain injury and uh, policing and public safety. And uh, so if any of you are interested in learning a little bit about brain injury, and also engaging with other organizations with pol uh, policing. And of course the focus is is, is on brain injury, but also uh, we've widened it up for just working with any, uh, with any population, uh, disability population. So that's on September 26th. I ask that you go to the PSEP or the Portland Community Engagement Policing um, website and sign up because um, we are limited. We're gonna be at the Melody, what's what's that called? Melody Hall, I think, or Melody Event Center. Okay. And uh, there's there's a head count <laughs> restriction. So if you would sign up, I'd appreciate it. The one, the one last thing is unfortunately somebody has hacked and dissolved both our uh, website, which is back up as well as our telephone. And we didn't realize that they were disarmed, if you will, uh, for quite some time. The telephone is not up, but our but our website is. And thank you very much for allowing this time. Bye. Thanks, Fern. And I just want to confirm, is that June 26th or September? Um, the day of the event. Yeah, I think, wait, now just a second. I got myself confused. Do you have something that tells you something different? I don't have a link. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. I'm a positive. It's June 20. So Andy, 20 is, Andy is June. Okay, great. June. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. No problem. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you both. Okay. Anyone else have anything else to share? Okay. Awesome. Well, I will give you three minutes back in your day. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for being here, for all the work that you do. I hope you have a fabulous, sunny Tuesday and a great rest of your week. And happy um, Juneteenth as well. And I hope you can get out and enjoy some of the activities going on. So thank you again. Be well. <laughs>